This is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. This is going to be your fifth and last uh, installment of our uh, module on protozoal infections. Uh, this module will be focused on travel medicine, uh, both preparation of a traveler to go to a developing region and an evaluation of the ill returning traveler. The learning objectives here is we'd like you to know that travel health risks are dependent on the underlying medical condition, as well as the itinerary, duration of travel, purpose of travel, and planned activities. You should recognize that common causes of fever in returning traveler from developing countries. Be aware that fever in a returning traveler from a malaria endemic region is a medical emergency, and that we want you to understand the key epidemiological features, clinical manifestations, and prevention strategies of dengue fever. So as you can see here from this figure, that there has been a near exponential increase in tra uh, travelers causing international borders over the last several decades. Um, there, this, this figure also has a projection to show up until t uh, 2020 that there continues to be this very high rate of growth of international uh, travel. What does this mean to uh, the physician? What it means is that you're either going to be asked by a patient to either help you prepare to travel for a developing country, or you'll be more likely to see an ill returning traveler from a developing country uh, in the years to come. So what are the risks associated with travel to developing countries? Well, data shows that about half of uh, folks to, who visit a developing country and will report some illness, one to 5% will seek medical attention. Uh, 3% will develop fevers, 1 in 1,000 to 10,000 actually will require medical evacuation, and 1 in 100,000 will die during travel but not necessarily related to it. Here you can see that the image that I put here is not of a uh, vector that causes infection or somebody with a uh, rare tropical disease, but I think I want to take a moment to make the point that actually the most common cause of death in travelers in developing countries is actually car accidents, and that it is important to educate your patients on uh, how to, to uh, safely travel uh, during their stays there, not drinking and driving, wearing seatbelts, which are the same things that you'll say to patients here in the U.S. So what do you do with, for a patient when you want to evaluate them prior to travel? Well, you want to first assess the health of the traveler itself. So if you had a patient who had underlying severe lung disease, had severe asthma, or some other underlying disease, and that was not well controlled, that would probably be the most likely cause of them having a medical complication during travel. So assessing that all their other comorbid conditions are under good control. Two, obviously you have to assess the risk of travel itself. Where are they going to be going to? Uh, what are they going to be doing while they're there? Um, and I think there's a lot of information you can get by itinerary uh, about what their risks are going to be. You want to educate them about safe practices. You want to vaccinate them, make sure they're up to date on their routine vaccinations, but you also want to uh, get them vaccinated against uh, s specific uh, diseases uh, that they may encounter during their travel. And then you want to prescribe prophylactic medications as needed. An earlier module, we talked about chemoprophylaxis for patients who are going to malaria endemic regions, so giving them actually anti-malarial medications to prevent malaria during while they're there. And sometimes we give patients self-treatment medications, so we may give them medications to treat themselves if they develop severe diarrheal disease. What I have here, just to talk a little bit about um, the risk of travel, is a malaria risk map of India. And you can see here that India is a very heterogeneous country when it comes to malaria risk, and that in the red areas um, that you can see, um, the dark red areas are the most high risk uh, for malaria, whereas the crosshatched areas are of some risk, and then there's actually no risk felt to be in some of the white areas. So it really depends on where they are planning to travel to to help you uh, decide whether they need something like malaria prophylaxis. So what kind of education are you going to provide? Well, you're going to go over safe food and water use, um, given that diarrheal disease uh, is the most common cause of illness in travelers. You're going to instruct them how to avoid uh, insects that may carry uh, diseases. 
educate everybody on safe sex and avoidance of animals that may carry diseases. Um, I'm going to focus in the most detail right now about safe food and water uh, and in insect avoidance. So what is the concern about food and water safety? As I said, diarrhea, diarrheal disease is the most common cause of illness in travelers going to developing countries. These are predominantly due to bacterial infections like E. coli, Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonella. Occasionally it's from viruses like uh, norovirus. You may have seen on the news things like uh, norovirus outbreaks on cruise ships, and then protozoal infections like we talked about in the GI section of this protozoal module, uh, with Giardia being most common, but we see things like Cryptosporidium and Tamoeba infections as well. Several forms of viral hepatitis, hepatitis A and E, are both transmitted by uh, contaminated food and water, and typhoid fever, which is a bacterial infection caused by Salmonella, uh, is also can be uh, transmitted by contaminated food and water. So therefore, good uh, safe practices when around eating and drinking are important. Um, so the, the mantra that I think a lot of people have learned are boil it, peel it, cook it, or forget it. And that's a statement uh, you can often see in a lot of manuals that essentially applies that food that is cooked, uh, food that is peeled, so inside a banana, inside an orange is likely going to be uh, not contaminated. Uh, food that uh, gets cooked and is hot is unlikely to have uh, contaminants uh, are really the ways to go. Um, but uh, what a lot of studies have shown that even in higher risk areas, if the food is prepared in a safe way, uh, that it may be fine. Um, but even less safe foods uh, in certain areas that are not prepared, prepared in a safe way uh, may be at higher risk. So this is an imperfect approach, but it's a, it's a good and easy remembered thing to share with your patients. So what about vector-borne illnesses? So um, there are a lot of different uh, uh, insects that can spread different infections in the uh, developing countries, mosquitoes being the most common. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about dengue fever, but dengue, chikungunya fever, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, West Nile virus. Mosquitoes can also spread protozoa and helminth infections like malaria, which we've talked about, but also helminth infections that you'll learn about like filariasis. Flies, uh, you learned about in the uh, tissue protozoa section about leishmaniasis another helminth loa loa, and then ticks. In the U.S., we suffer from rickettsial infections, but in Africa, there's African tick bite fever. There's Borrelia infections like Lyme disease, tularemia, viral infections like tick-borne encephalitis, and other protozoal infections spread by ticks like Babesia, which we talked about in an earlier uh, section of this module. How do we prevent insect exposures? Well, I think one of the most important things to do is try to avoid high-risk areas. So the CDC website on travel, and I've included it here, is a good resource uh, to use and instruct your patients to identify areas that are having outbreaks, such as those with dengue fever. And if you could avoid an area that is having an outbreak, that's probably the best approach. Um, when you can and you're in an area with risk, you want to avoid the high-risk periods. So particularly in malarious endemic regions, um, dust to dawn is at high risk. So making sure that you're using protective strategies during that time. Physical barriers such as proper clothing and bed nets. Um, insect repellent, so DEET for the skin. Um, and I have a picture here of a long-acting DEET product um, that is uh, helpful for patients given that they don't have to apply it as frequency. And using permethrin on their clothing or bed nets can also uh, in uh, increase your ability to avoid uh, an insect uh, exposure. So what are the most common medical issues that we see in travelers to developing countries? Uh, so fever, acute diarrhea, dermatological disorders, chronic diarrhea, and then non-diarrheal gastrointestinal disorders. So often patients presenting with a nonspecific uh, abdominal pain, uh, for example. So I'm gonna focus on this, given this is a, a short segment, primarily on fever in a returning traveler. Um, and how do you determine the etiology of a fever in a returning traveler? So these are the five clues that I, think that is most important to uh, think about when you do have a patient returning with fever. You want to think about their destination. So where were they? What are What is endemic in those regions? You want to think about incubation period, given that different infections have different incubation periods. So for example, if you've been home for three weeks um, and you um, 
felt well for those three weeks and now you have a fever, you probably don't have dengue fever, which has an incubation period of four to seven days. Um, however, if you've only been in a malaria risk area for a couple days and then you have a fever, the life cycle of malaria is much longer, so you unlikely have malaria. You want to think about exposures, and you can see here, this is uh, Lake Victoria, an area where there is schistosomiasis, and you want to think about schistosomiasis infection um, if they've swam in a risk uh, area with fresh water. You want to use their exam findings. Did they have a rash suggestive of one infection or another? Laboratory changes, and then whether they were taking chemoprophylaxis uh, for things like malaria and whether they got immunizations will also help guide your differential diagnosis. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data on the etiology of fevers in travelers. So as you can see here, the two most common identifiable causes of fever in travelers are uh, dengue fever, as you can see is most common uh, in the Caribbean, Central and South America, Southeast Asia, and South Central uh, Asia. And then malaria is, although common in many of these places, is really most common uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Other common causes of fever in returning travelers are we talked about typhoid or salmonella uh, infection, certain types of rickettsia infections, and Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus infection. I want to, given that dengue is common, I do want to spend a little extra time talking about dengue fever. Uh, dengue is spread by the Aedes mosquito. So this is a different mosquito than the one that is, uh, sp that spreads malaria. It uh, bites kind of, uh, it has, a, it's not really a dust to dawn biter. It's uh, more of a daytime biter. Uh, and this mosquito, can be present in both urban and rural areas. And there are over 100 million cases of dengue per year. In terms of virology, dengue virus is a flavivirus, uh, which means it's related to other viruses like yellow fever, uh, West Nile virus. This is a map of dengue risk area, and I all would recommend if you have the opportunity to visit the CDC webpage of their dengue map. But you can see that dengue is highly endemic in, uh, very, in the Caribbean, uh, Mexico area, South America, um, Indian subcontinent, and all of Southeast Asia. There's less dengue disease uh, seen in Africa. Clinical manifestations. So as I mentioned before, it has a short incubation period, usually four to seven days. Dengue fever usually presents with fever, headache, and a rash. And you can see here, this is a diffuse uh, maculopapular rash in a patient of mine who is returning from Nicaragua with dengue. Um, and you can see that one of the features of this rash is these islands of sparing. So you can see that there's a rash, but then there's these kind of white areas. So these are usually termed as a maculopapular rash with islands of sparing. Um, patients can have low white blood cells, low platelets, and elevated liver function tests. Um, and then it can progress in a second phase to dengue hemorrhagic fever, which can be quite severe. Patients can go on to develop low blood pressure, hypotension, shock, uh, severe bleeding. This is more common in children and in patients who've been infected with one type of dengue and then infected later on with a second type of dengue. You diagnose this by serological testing. You can do IgM uh, testing for this. You can also do PCR testing. Treatment really is supportive. There's no antivirals available, um, but it's uh, treating the patient symptomatically, and if they develop dengue hemorrhagic fever, uh, supporting them with uh, blood uh, products, uh, IV infusions, et cetera. Preventing is really avoiding insect exposure using DEET uh, and avoiding high-risk areas. Also, on a community level, is clearing areas like these soldiers are doing of like uh, tires that can have water in it and are a good breeding ground for mosquitoes. The last thing I wanted to mention, because we were talking about dengue, are there some other important viral infections in the developing world that are becoming more and more important? And you should be aware of them. Chikungunya fever is uh, the first one that I'm going to mention. Chikungunya fever, although hard to say, is an extremely common uh, uh, infection. It is spread by a similar mosquito uh, to that that causes dengue. And its really distribution is becoming more worldwide. And now there's been quite an outbreak in the Caribbean, very close uh, to home. And there's going to be more and more cases here in the U.S. 
Patients present with fever, headache, rash, and it's a bit hard to distinguish from dengue. Patients may have more joint symptoms. Diagnosis is based on serology, IgG, Ig IgM testing, and really the only way to prevent it is mosquito avoidance. Ebola hemorrhagic fever is another one that is much less common, but important to know about. It's spread from human to human contact. There's been most cases have been in Africa and there's a severe outbreak ongoing now. Uh, patients can present with fever, shock, hemorrhage. Diagnosis is based on serology and you wanna avoid infected fluids. And lastly is yellow fever. Uh, yellow fever is also spread by mosquitoes. Most of the two areas of the world that have yellow fever are those in Sub-Saharan Africa and Amazonia in Cent uh, South America. Patients may develop fever, liver and renal failure and hemorrhage and diagnosis is also by serology. For yellow fever though, there is a vaccine available which is highly effective and is recommended to travelers going to risk areas. This is the end of our five-part series on protozoal infections.